the, the, the principles and the precepts put forth today have, have application to building relationships. And I think all of us desire relationship. All of us, I believe, desire quality relationships, good relationship. And I believe if you'll stick around, you'll find out that some of those relationships are going to last a lot longer than what we maybe originally think so. Amen? Amen. So I want to talk to you about fishing. Before we talk about that, though, I want to open the scripture. I'm going to read a few verses from Matthew, a familiar passage, but maybe something we haven't read in quite a while. Matthew chapter 4, reading out of verse 13 in the King James. And now, leaving Nazareth, Jesus came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zebulon and Nephilim, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and the shadow of death, light is sprung up. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of God Amen. is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Praise God. Lord, we thank you for your word. Now these men who were sitting there by the coast, they were fishing with nets. And I am holding a fishing rod. And so it's a slightly different technique, but I want to talk to you today about the techniques, the principles, and the methods of fishing. I hope that we understand that it has direct application to our lives. For at the end of the day, Jesus walking by these two men, they, they were sitting in their solitary pursuit of fishing. Anyone that has been fishing knows that even when you go with buddies, there are just solitary moments. Jesus was calling them out of their solitary existence <clears throat> into a life of complex relationship. I think each of us has the ability to fall back into a shell, fall back into that place where we start to live kind of a solitary existence. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but you can be absolutely alone even in the midst of a crowd. Mm -hmm. I don't know if anybody's ever been in that place. I know that I have. I, I've been absolutely alone even though I was in a room full of people. I think that each of us would, would desire to have more quality relationships. I don't think any of us is probably walking around going, you know, I just have too many really, genuinely, truly good friends. <laughs> Some of us are probably walking around going, I know too many people, or too many people know me. But, but to walk around and say, I have too many quality friends. I have too many good relationships. There are too many people in my church. There are too many people that want me to spend time with them and do quality things. So. The principles and the techniques that we're talking about today, while I'm holding a fishing rod, I've got some fishing lures, we're talking about fishing, we've got pictures of fishing, but we're really talking about life principles. If we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, we're talking about principles that help us build, establish quality relationships, connection. Jesus was calling these men out of their solitary existence, a simple life of fishing at the seaside, into a far more complex relationship with eternal consequences. Now, I've got before me a bunch of different lures. We're going to talk about some techniques and, and some different ways to go fishing. Um, this is how I like to fish, not with a net, but with a fishing rod. I like to take the fishing rod out, and then I go, and it's, with, a, with a net, you're, you're fishing for, for a lot of fish at one time. You're hoping to catch them in a net, but you catch all kinds of different stuff. Typically, when you go out with a rod, you're looking for a fish at a time. Yes, you'd like to catch more than one on any given day, but it's one fish at a time. I think that you'll find that no matter what you do, at the end of the day, when it comes down to building the kingdom of God, it happens one relationship at a time, one person at a time. When you start to build your inner circle of trusted friends, when you start to build your, your contacts for work, your friends for school, the people that you share your life with, ultimately it happens one quality relationship at a time. 
So I'm going to talk to you about the techniques of, of how we fish, one by one. Amen? Now, I've been blessed to do a lot of fishing. I, I, I fished a lot as a young man, and I've gotten to fish some, not as often as I'd like, but with some recreation. And I will tell you that God has taught me and trained me things, and he's told me about fishing, and I've been very blessed. You'll see the picture in the upper left-hand corner. There's a picture of my dad. Uh, he's in the white shirt. I'm in the blue shirt. Still my favorite fishing buddy. Amen. The guy that, that if I can only go fishing with one person, that's him. I, I love to, to spend time with him and go fishing. And he's taught me a lot, but I'll tell you, the Lord has taught me more about fishing than anyone else. I don't get to go fishing as much as I want. I don't get to go fishing as often as I'd like. And so I, I, I trust that God makes the most of that time. And we have great success when we go fishing. Um, and, and as much as I'd like to say that's because I'm a great fisherman, <laughs> at the end of the day, I know it's just because he's blessed me. Amen? I, I've had, had a, a little window where I could go fishing, and it seems that he made the most of that time. But I will also tell you that I, I pray about fishing. When I'm, when I'm going fishing, I, 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 I pray that the Lord would bless us with good fishing. I pray that he would teach me and show me where to fish and how to fish. If I'm going fishing with my daddy, I pray that he shows my dad where to fish. If I'm going fishing with my buddies, I pray that, that the Lord would, would show my buddy, we don't show me where should we go fish and what should we do. And that's really the first principle that we share today. And this, this may seem like a very simple thing, but, but it, sometimes the most obvious and sometimes the most simple things are also sometimes the most complex things. Amen? The things that we, we, we're most apt to overlook. So the first thing I would say to you is if you're going to go fishing, go where the fish are. <laughs> Amen? Go where the fish are. I, I've got all these boxes of all these different lures. And you say, well, why do you have so many lures? And it's a very simple answer. It's because old fishermen never actually throw anything away. Um, we don't use most of this stuff, but once we've bought it, we don't ever throw it away because we think, you know, one day I might. And so we just kind of hang on to it. But the reality of the matter is, even with all of these lures here, if I sat in this room and I could try lure after lure after lure and throw them around this room, I probably wouldn't catch a single trout. I probably wouldn't catch a single grouper, no matter how many casts I threw, no matter how many lures in this room, because I'm fishing in the wrong room. I'm fishing in the wrong place. Okay? So if you want to catch fish, go to where the fish are. You know what? If you want to lead people into a relationship with Jesus Christ, well, this is a great room, but the odds are most of the people, probably everybody in this room, already has a relationship with Jesus Christ. So, really, fishing in this room is probably not going to produce a lot. But if you go out there, where they are, people that don't know the Lord, you better chance. Amen? Now, you could just drive. I could just get in the car and drive east till I hit the coast, and when I see water, I could start fishing. Or I could pray about where I should go fishing. And the Lord says, go fish here. So the first thing I would encourage you, whether you're looking to establish relationships just socially, personally, whether you're looking to establish business relationships, or if you're actually looking to build the kingdom of God, maybe you want to lead somebody to, to the Lord that, that doesn't know the Lord. Or maybe you want to, to, to reach out to somebody that, that does know the Lord, and maybe they went to church a long time ago, but they've stopped going to church. You want to leave, you know, there are many different types of evangelism. Evangelism is not just going to people that have never heard the gospel. There's a lot of people that, that have known the Lord, have been at church, and they've left. You can be evangelizing to, to invite people to church that just are not going to church right now. Maybe because they've never gone, or maybe because they're not going right now. But pray. Pray about where you would go, where the Lord would have you to go, who He would have you to talk to. And pray that He would open the doors. I pray about where we go fishing. And I pray that the Lord would bless us to catch fish when we get there. It would be kind of silly to pray about that if I'm going fishing for real fish and don't do that when we're reaching out to establish and build relationships. Amen? Mm -hmm. There are some principles and some techniques that we discuss when we go fishing. And, and one of them is, in, in, and I know, I know some, people, some people just go and they get in the boat or they get in the dock and they just sit there and they, they do this. <laughs> You know, and they just, just, they just sit there in a spot and say, well, you know, if something comes my way, it's good fishing. If something doesn't come my way, it's bad fishing. That's it. I like to be an active participant in the process. I like to be engaged. And I like to apply principles that help in the process. So there are systems and things and techniques you can do. There's some expressions that you come up with. And one of those expressions is fish the water in front of you. And, and, I, and I shared this story with the guys yesterday at the men's breakfast, but, but it, it, it's very true. 
and, and some of you maybe have never watched, but I can assure you, if, if you watch sometime, if you went to a big lake, or even if you watched a fishing tournament, it, let's say this, this huge lake, it has a, has a boat dock on this end of the lake where you put your boat in, it has a boat dock on this end of the lake where you put your boat in. I can assure you, if you were able to watch, you got a helicopter or whatever, or you just got up on a mountain and you watched the lake, what you would find is all the guys who put their boat in over here at this boat ramp would get in their boat and they would drive to that side of the lake and they would start fishing. And the guys who put their boat in the lake on this side of the lake would drive to that side of the lake and they would do all their fishing. Amen? There's something inherent about us that says that we've got to go over there to find fish. And I, the irony is that if you ever watch fishing tournaments, you find a lot of times the guys who win the fishing tournaments, they're fishing like, like even if they're in their boat, they're fishing 20 or 50 feet from the dock. Because everybody gets in at the dock and goes to the other side of the lake, nobody's fishing where the dock is. All the fish are just hanging out there because there's nobody catching them. And so some guy says, well, I'm just going to fish here because nobody else is fishing here. And he catches a bunch of fish and he wins the tournament. Okay? Fish the water in front of you. Sometimes we think that we've got to go to some other continent or some other country or some other state or some other world to evangelize, to, to make relationships, to make friendships. Well, I, I just I need to move to a different town so I can make friends. So, so you can't make friends in the town that you live in where you know all the streets, all the culture, all the demographics, all the, all the ins and outs of the community. You can't make friends there, but you think you're going to go to a totally strange community where you don't know anybody and don't know anything about it, and you're going to make friends there. Okay? You never want anybody to the Lord in your own neighborhood where you, where you speak the language, you know the streets, and, and you wear the local attire, but you're going to go to another country that you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, and you don't know anything about the people, and you're going to win souls to the Lord there. Just saying. Amen? Start by fishing the water in front of you. You know, there's, there's a tendency that we go out and we look and we see this great pond. I, I like fish in salt water. And we go out and we see a great, huge bay, of, a body of water everywhere. And you're thinking, wow, I could fish over there, I could fish here, I could fish there. And after a while, you realize pretty much all the water looks like all the other water. <laughs> and, and even though you're sitting in front of this water and this water looks great, and it's got fish in it, you're thinking, that's the water I should be in. <laughs> or that's where I should be fishing. Because fish the water in front of you. You've got water right in front of you. We've got neighbors in our neighborhood. We've got people that are workplaces, that are, that are wanting friends, that are wanting church connections, that are wanting relational connections, that are wanting help, that are wanting people to pick for them. Fish the water that's in front of you. Amen? Yeah. Now, there's something else that we call fishing around the clock. And that doesn't mean fishing 24 hours a day. It, it, it's a metaphor. Anybody that's been in the military or that's worked in some different types of applications will understand it. Sometimes, geographically, you refer to a clock. Right ahead of you is 12 noon. To the right would be 3 o'clock, to the left would be 9 o'clock, behind you would be your 6, your 6 o'clock. If somebody's sneaking up behind you, then you say, they're, on, they're coming up on my 6. Or if somebody's supposed to be watching your back, you say, they've got my 6, they're behind you. So 12's out in front of you. Well, when you're fishing, especially if you're by yourself, you start fishing around the clock. You throw, you throw a cast here, you throw a cast there. 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. You, you fish around the clock. Why? Because you're looking out at the water, and all the water looks the same. But there might be fish here, there might be fish there. If you just fish right in front of you, right in front of what you can see, and you just get stuck in this little routine, and you just keep throwing in front of you, there can be fish over there, and you'll never know it. <laughs> Amen? If you're drifting in the boat, or you're walking, you just keep fishing here, and you have no idea there's fish there. But if you will, if, if you will implement disciplines in your life, if you will create and develop disciplines and systems, and for example, when you go fishing, you fish around the clock. You're fishing water that you don't know. You don't know where the fish are at, so you just start to fish around the clock. You make a cast here, 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 here. I'm telling you, I, I, I've done that before, and I'll be fishing around, and nothing, 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 and boom, I'll catch a fish here. Well, you know what? When you catch a fish here, go back there. Fish congregate together. They like to hang out together. They're kind of like people. They like to hang out together, okay? I, I tell you, I, I've sometimes I've, I've caught a fish, and this water looked no different than that water or this water, but all of a sudden I'll catch a fish right here, and I'll throw back to, you know, I've caught like 10 or 12, 14 fish out of, out of this same spot. It didn't look any different than the others. But there was something under the water that I couldn't see. There was some structure. There was a rock, a log. There was a hole, a depression. There was, was, was something there that made the fish congregate in that place. I couldn't see it, but the reality of the matter was I caught a fish there and not over here, so let me keep, I've, I've got a pattern. I've, I found out through my work, my discipline, my system, my structure that this area is producing. Producing relationship, producing fruit, focus on that. Okay, fish it till you fish it out. 
once you're no longer catching fish there, don't spend the whole rest of the day just throwing here. I'm not throwing anything over there because I caught a fish to my left earlier today, and I will spend the rest of my life only fishing to my left. You know what we call that? We call that a religious system. We call that a broken mindset. Amen? Because the next day you go fishing, all the fishing are over, fish are over here on your right, but you're still throwing to your left, okay? Next day you go out fishing, follow your pattern. Next fishing spot you go to, you fish this area out, you walk somewhere, or you ride somewhere in the boat, you get to your next spot, go right back to your pattern. Start fishing around the clock. Find your fish. Amen? Because sometimes we can't always see what's there. You know, it's very easy in a business setting to say, well, I... Those people over there in that water, they don't want to do any business with me. Those people over here don't want to do any business with me. It's very easy to walk into school and go, well, the people sitting at that lunch table, I know they don't want to talk to me. And the people sitting at that lunch table, they don't have any problems. They don't want to hear about my problems. And the people over there, you know what? Fish the clock. Fish the clock. Because you find when you just start going to your systems, you find when you just reach out to people, You'll find, oh wow, they do have some of the same problems I've got. We do have a connection. Wow, they are, they look like they've got it all together, but they don't have it all together. We, we've got some things. Well, they look like they've got lots of friends, but they're actually lonely. When we go through our disciplines and we go through our progressions, and we start fishing, all of a sudden we open the door to connections and relationships that we didn't know. I can assure you, if you've owned your own business, you'll find very often that the, the people who you thought would never do business with you sometimes become your best clients. You ever walked into a new school or a new setting or a new job and thought, wow, that, that definitely, if there's one person in here that I do not like, I don't know anything <laughs> about it, but it's that person, mm -hmm. and you find out they, tend, they wind up being your best friend yep. over time? It, it's very often the people that we want to dismiss that wind up being the best relationships that we create. Now, I know nobody here has done this, but I've heard that some of the people at the church down the other street did this, that you walk into a place to share the gospel, and you go, well, they... They definitely don't want to hear the gospel from me. And so you dismiss part of the room. You dismiss individuals, people, situations, circumstances. And you know what? If you work your system, if you follow your disciplines, every now and then you're going to find somebody that you have a relationship with that you would have otherwise not had a relationship with. Maybe they come to church with you. Maybe they're a business contact. Maybe they're just a good social friend. But it's a relationship that you wouldn't have otherwise had because you're not working your systems. You're not following your disciplines. You're just kind of, because at the end of the day, I've got news for you. It's not me that determines whether the fish bites or not. At the end of the day, it's the fish. All I do is make the presentation. Mm -hmm. And I, I go through my system. I open the doors. And you know what, at the end of the day, whether we're reaching out for business or we're reaching out for social, or let's say we're trying to build the kingdom of God. At the end of the day, I'm not responsible for how many are caught. Amen? I'm not responsible for the results. God takes care of the results. God is responsible for the results. I, I, my job is to show up and follow my systems and work my routines and to do what I know to do what I'm instructed to do. Don't dismiss, don't discount, don't overlook. Open the door, touch the lives, create the relationships, and see what God is going to do. We say, well, I don't need a relationship with that person. They'll never come to church. Really, that's probably the person that God wants to open a new ministry through. But nobody will reach out to them. If we follow our systems, we trust God with the result, and we do our work. Now listen, sometimes you go to a fishing hole. You fish around the clock, you've changed lures, you've done the right things, and there's no fish bite. Move. Amen? Just move to a different fishing spot. Change your techniques. Don't get discouraged. You know, the Scripture tells us, and we've been studying it in the book of James, the book of James tells us, count it all joy when various trials, tribulations, I'm going to translate that into a modern English fishing sermon, okay? Have fun even when the fish aren't biting. Mm -hmm. Have fun even when the fish aren't biting. Enjoy the process. You know, if, if all I was focused on was, was catching fish, and I went out to the coast, 
and it's a beautiful sunny day. I get to watch the sunrise. The birds are flying around. The water's beautiful. There's stuff going on around me. I'm relaxing. I'm enjoying environment. But all I care about is the fact that I didn't catch any fish. I've totally missed the beauty of the process. I've missed the beauty of the creation. And worse yet, if I go fishing with somebody, let's say I went fishing with my dad that way that day. It was just me and my dad, and we're just out there <coughs> wading, and we're fishing. And, 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 and all I'm focused on is catching fish, and I don't catch any fish at the end of the day, and I'm miserable. I missed out on the opportunity to enjoy being with my dad. Come on, somebody. I am preaching, by the way. I hope you've got ears to hear what the Spirit's saying. Amen? Sometimes we get so focused on the results and, and that we lose the joy of the companionship of who we're with and the beauty of the creation that we're in. You know what? Some days you go out and it seems like every cast there's a fish. And it's easy to enjoy those days. And other days you go out and the wind is blowing, the rod's not working right, <laughs> hook in your finger, the boat broke down, the trailer got a flat tire, it's too windy, the water's muddy, the fish aren't bite. You know, ar, 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 ar. It's still a beautiful place. You can still enjoy the process, even though everything's not working out. And I would dare say that it's actually scriptural that we're supposed to enjoy the process. Now listen, if you do go fishing with somebody else, Enjoy the company. Spend time with that person. But I'll tell you this. If you go fishing, we've got all these different lures. Use some different lures. If two guys go fishing, you should never be using exactly the same lure. Okay? Or two gals go fishing. Use two different lures. Because you know what? If one person gets a fish on this, and the other person's never getting a bite on this, well, you know what? Then you switch over and everybody starts using this. But let's say you're both using one of these, and nothing's biting. The fish is sitting around waiting for one of these, but nobody's throwing one of these, okay? So think about what you're doing. Have a little plan. Now, I do want to point out that while I'm in here, I got this little lizard guy, okay? I, I never use this. This thing's ridiculous, but, but it, it's in the tackle box. Bought it years ago. Never threw it away. But we were up here yesterday for the men's breakfast, and I just, by way of confession, because we're supposed to confess things, want to let you know that Joel... And Gabriel were trying really hard to talk me into putting this into Pastor Debbie's cup of coffee. You know, the pranksters that they are. And me, being the voice of reason and conservative, proper behavior that I am, insisted that they not do it. But they really tried hard to talk me into doing it. So it's a good thing I was here to restrain that, 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 that work. So... Um, I don't think there's one in your coffee cup, but, but you may want to check. But I keep an eye on these two guys because, I mean, they are, you know they are. Rowdy rebel rousers they are. So it's a good thing that I was there being the behaved one that I am. So, um, yes. So um, when you're out there and you're fishing and you're working your patterns, look for irregularities, trends, opportunities. You see, because you can be out there, like we talked about, all the water pretty much looks the same, but there's just a slightly different ripple on the water here than there is anywhere else. I have no idea what's causing that. Don't know if it's because there's something underneath the water that's causing the ripple. Don't know if it's because there's some fish gathered in that area that's causing the ripple. Don't know if there's a change in depth, a change in temperature, a stump or whatever. But anytime there's an irregularity, an opportunity, work that opportunity. Right? You may, you may look at the news and say, well, there's a tragic event. Well, it, it, there is a tragic event, but you know what? It's also an irregularity. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity maybe to engage and create relationship. You know, something really bad just happened to somebody at work. Nobody likes him anyhow. Well, you know what? It may be the one time, because they're a huge jerk, but it may be the one time that they're actually humble enough to, to work that opportunity. Look for opportunities. Look for irregularities. Now, I will tell you this. Um, one, one of the things that, that I love to do and when we go fishing, um, particularly with my dad, but obviously, you know, it's fun to go somewhere in the boat and it's beautiful and all, but one of my favorite things to do is to take the boat someplace where we're not around a lot of other folks and then get out of the boat and get into the water. You get out on a sandbar or something, a, a, a bar out in the middle of the bay, and it just, it's surrounded by water, but it becomes shallow in that area and you can start to want weight. And I love to get out there and, you know, get thigh deep, waist deep, or whatever. And here's the thing, I think we catch more fish when we're waiting than any other time. 
I, I really believe there are times that we go out there, there's professional guides, they've got fancy boats, they've got live bait, they've got all this stuff, and we're out there fishing our lures, but we're waiting, and we're catching more fish than they are. We're out fishing anybody around us. And I believe there's a couple reasons for that. But, but the first and foremost is that we've gotten out of the boat and we've got in the water. We, we've, we've immersed ourselves in that environment. Because see, there's some things that happen when I'm actually waiting in the water. I, when I'm waist deep in the water, I can begin to feel the depth change. If there's a six inch change in the water, I notice it as I'm walking. As I'm walking, if there's a temperature change of just a few degrees, I can feel that water temperature change. When the current begins to move, I can feel not only the current moving, but I can feel which direction it's flowing in. I can feel the seagrass, whether the bottom is soft or hard, whether there are shells or oysters or crustaceans, or if it's a soft, silty bottom. I begin to become immersed in the environment that I'm in, and I begin to connect with that environment, and I'm much more sensitive to what is flowing and moving in that environment. And as a result, I believe we catch more fish. I would encourage you, when you're going fishing, to get immersed in your environment. Amen? Get immersed in your environment. Could connect with the emotions and the feelings of the people that you are reaching out to. Understand where you are and what they're feeling and what they're doing. And look for the movement. Hey, come on now, look to see where the current is. Mm -hmm. Because I've got to tell you, when the current starts to move in the bay, if it's a good current, everything gets caught up in it. Any, anything that's in it gets moved by that current. You throw something in the water, and it's going to get moved by that current. And, and, and if you're somewhere, and you're immersed in a culture, and the Spirit of God starts to move through there, everything in that place is going to move, whether it wants to or not. Amen? Even the seagrass that's anchored to the floor of the ocean begins to sway and lean that way. Things that were otherwise immovable, when the spirit begins to move, they begin to lean. Take advantage of that opportunity because you're there fishing. You're working your systems. You're working your disciplines. You're doing the things that you know to do, that you've been taught and trained to do. And you're trusting the Lord for the results. Because you're immersed in the culture, you're flowing in the current, and it's working. Amen? Amen. Now, some days you get out there and you know, it's just what you're doing is not working. Maybe you caught fish with this technique and this method yesterday, but it's not working today. The tides change. The barometer changes. The weather changes. Some days you have more sunlight. Some days you have more cloud cover. Some days you have more current. Some days less current. Some, some days that there's just certain things with the moon or with the sun or with the sky, the wind, the water, the, 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 the water's dirty or the water's not. It, it's different every time you go out. And sometimes the thing that caught fish all day long yesterday won't produce a fish today. We need to be flexible, not stuck in such a rut that we say, well, that worked yesterday. I'm doing that every day for the rest of my life. So you know what, that worked yesterday, but it's not working today. Let me admit that I need to change lures, I need to change techniques, I need to change fishing holes today. I need to, to, to change my approach. Amen? Listen, a, a few things are always consistent. Things you, you begin to look at these lures, and you see these different lures, and you notice they have sound, they have light reflectivity, and they have movement. All of these things are designed. This, this rattles and swims. This has this big tongue because it wiggles going through the water. It simulates the motion of a live fish. This dodges and darts. This thing here, it, it, it zigzags across the top of the water, but it rattles. All of these things have something in common. They make motion, sound, and light that cause a fish to strike. Now, one day, maybe the fish wants to strike this. One day, he wants to go after this. Another day, he's looking for something in here. But all of it is the same basic thing. There's, there's a primal reaction to the motion, the vibration, and the light. The message has never changed. The one who the message is about has never changed. It's the same primal reaction that we have to the love and to the goodness and the presence of God. But sometimes the techniques the methods in which we deliver it are no longer working. 
And we need to change our technique. We need to change how we're reaching out. Maybe the script or the method that you used five or 10 or 20 or 40 or 50 years ago to engage people in relationship, maybe that just doesn't work today. Change. Don't change the message. Just change the method, the presentation. That's ultimately what we call it. When we go fishing, <coughs> we're presenting a lure to the fish and then bringing it back. If you throw a heavy lure, something very heavy, on a still calm day into shallow water, the splash will scare the fish off. Sometimes the, the presentation that we use when we're reaching out to somebody is way too heavy. It makes way too big a splash. It scares everything away. But you know what? If you go out with a very light bait and you make a very light presentation on a windy day when the water is rough and there's a lot of going on, it never gets noticed. The fish won't even react to it because they're reacting to things that are making more noise and more. There are times that we need a bold presentation. Let us be sensitive to the environment and what is going on around us and, and, and make the proper presentation. And let us be humble enough to know that when our presentation, when our reach out is not being received, when it's not working, when it's not responding, that we change the method of our presentation without altering the core of what we're doing. We don't change the gospel. It doesn't need to be changed. We don't change the Savior because He doesn't change and He doesn't need to be saved, changed. But, but there are varying techniques of how we present that love and that life to reach the environment that we're in. Let us be mindful. Let us go back to that first principle. Let us go where the fish are and let us pray about where that would be and follow the Lord's leading. Now, I said a prophetic word. This, things like this just get me so excited. I don't know if you get excited about the Word of God, but these kind of things about the Word of God excite me. I have had people tell me, and I have preached about this for years, but I got a new wrinkle from the Lord on this that really just lit me up. It says in Revelation in chapter 21 in verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. I've talked about fishing one day in heaven. People have said, well, there's no more sea, there's no more fish. And I've taught for years that that is not what that scripture means. First of all, just on an intuitive level, we have a creative God who spent clearly an immense amount of his creative ability putting all of these magnificent things into the ocean and creating the beauty of the ocean. And I meet very few people that don't say, well, the ocean is beautiful. I meet very few people that don't want to go to a vacation near the ocean at some point. And to say that, well, God's going to do that for this life, but then he's going to throw it away after that, just intuitively doesn't make sense to me. But I don't base my faith just upon what's intuitive. I, I like to look at what the scripture says. Now, the scripture says there's no more sea. Does that mean that there's no more beach, there's no more fish, there's no more ocean? And I do not believe that it does. The book of Revelation is, is a book that is essentially written kind of in a code. Because John was in prison. And he was imprisoned by a government that did not want to be told that there was another government coming that was greater than it. Okay? Just a secret. If you're ever in prison and you want to get out of prison, don't write a letter and show it to the guards that say that you're going to be delivered from prison by somebody that's going to defeat their prison. Okay? It's not a good way to make friends. It's not a good presentation as you're reaching out to make friends in your environment. So John wanted to communicate a message to the church by the Spirit of God but he was constrained by the environment that he was in. And so God gave him wisdom to communicate with the church in such a way that people who had ears to hear would understand what the Spirit was saying, and those who were without the Spirit would remain deaf and dumb as a board. Amen? And by the way, that is scriptural. The scripture says, without the Spirit of God, you cannot understand what the Spirit of God is saying. Amen? You can't understand God's Word without the Spirit of God. So when people look at you and go, I don't understand, understand that it's scriptural. 
Okay? Don't get frustrated with them. Your Bible tells you that the heathen will not understand what you're trying to tell them until they have the Spirit of God. It's nonsense to them. The Bible literally says that it is foolishness. To share this word with someone that has not the Spirit of God, they see this word as foolishness. So, getting in their face and saying you're going to hell because you don't love God may not be the best way to produce fruit or to bring in a harvest. Amen? Um, we first connect with them relationally. The Bible tells us it is the goodness of God that draws men and women under repentance. It is the love of God. Let us build a bridge before we try to carry the message across. Because the message is foolishness until they are touched by the Spirit of God. Let us be carriers of of the Spirit of God, the love of God, the presence of God, and allow the Holy Spirit to come in and do the work. We follow the techniques. We follow the methods. God is responsible for the results. Let us pray. Let us be filled with the Spirit. Let us trust the Spirit. Now, back to my point. Prophetic nugget to send you home with today. There will be no more seed. I am utterly and thoroughly convinced that in the book of Revelation and even in the prophecy scriptures, that C means unbelievers. C is code for unbelievers. Just like in the book of Revelation, stars is code for angels. When the book of Revelation talks about the stars of the sky or the stars fell, it's talking about angels. When it talks about eyes, it is talking about believers. When you read the book of Revelation and it talks about eyes, eyes are believers. You and I, believers who reach the kingdom of heaven, are eyes. Unbelievers are the sea, S-E-A. They are the sea. They are the mass of humanity that does not believe, and the stars are the angels. Bear with me and I'll show it unto you. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. And before the throne of God there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. That is an exact picture of the wilderness tabernacle that, that the children of Israel sat in. They sat in the, the tabernacle of God was set in the middle, and there were four groups of three tribes. There were three tribes here, three tribes here, three tribes here, and three tribes. Four camps around, just like four beasts. The four beasts are the camps, the gatherings of believers. The eyes are the believers themselves. Each of those camps had, each of those tribes, each of those camps was represented by a beast, an ox, an eagle, a lion. Okay? It is an exact picture in heaven of what was given in a representation in the wilderness. Now, it says that before the throne there was a sea of glass. A better translation for that in the original Greek would mean opposite, on the other side. So what you have is it says around the throne, it literally means surrounding the throne, was these beasts full of eyes. What you literally have is, is, is the presence of God, the throne of God, which represents, is represented by the original wilderness tabernacle. It is utterly surrounded by the believers worshiping in the throne room. And beyond them, this is an amazing yet tragic picture, is this sea of unbelievers who are literally watching the believers worship God. And it says they are transparent like a sea of glass, like under crystal, meaning they, that there is transparency. All of the lies and the deceptions have been exposed. That all, all of, all of the, the delusion has been exposed, all the deceptions, and they are sitting there, and there is a complete revelation. Now, I can prove to you first by the Scripture that the eyes are the believers, because it says in Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. It's the seven churches of the seven spirits of God. The lamb is Jesus Christ. He is there at the throne. And he came, and he took a book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when I, John, had taken the book, the four beasts... All of the beasts, all the gathered of eyes, and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, every one of them having harps and golden vials full of odors, which were the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, tongue, people, and nation. There is only one 
creature in all of creation that has been redeemed by the blood of God, and that is you and me. Fallen human beings who are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Angels cannot be redeemed because they are not blood, born of blood and water. Only a human being born of blood and water can be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, these who sat around the throne, redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, out of every kindred, tongue, and people, and nation are you and me, the believers, we are the eyes of of the beast. The beast is the groups of people. The eyes are the individual believers that surround the throne. The eyes are the saints of God worshiping around the throne. The sea is the unbelievers. In Jude, we read the same. Jude is, is an in-book prophecy all the way from Enoch all the way to Jude. Right into the book of Revelation, John and Jude would have been on the same page. Jude said, but these speak evil things. Jude chapter 1. We know it's chapter 1 because there's only one chapter in Jude. Amen. <laughs> Verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not. But they, they know naturally as brute beasts in those things that corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. They ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and they perished in the gainsaying of Kor. These are spots, blemishes in your feast of love when they feast with you. They feed themselves without fear of you or of God. They, they are clouds without water. They are carried about of winds. They to and fro by every wind of doctrine. They are trees who have fruit that does not last. They are trees without fruit. They are twice dead. They are plucked. That is not a good thing, amen? Twice dead, plucked up by the roots, bearing no fruit, bad fruit. Not, not a good place to be. They are, listen now, raging waves of the sea. These apostate, these vocal, these false hypocritical prophets, teachers, people who have come in and among the midst of the people, they are described as raging waves. They are literally out of the sea. They are unbelievers, but they are at another level. They are the peaks of the waves that stick up above the rest of the sea because the sea is consistently in the prophetic books, the unbelievers. They are foaming out of their own shame. They are wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. I don't know about you, I don't know where you got your theology degree, but I'm pretty sure that the blackness of darkness forever does not describe the kingdom of heaven. I'm pretty sure these are lost folks, lost souls. Amen? The sea. The sea is unbelievers. Verse 14. Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of their ungodly deeds, deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This is the sea. The ungodly. The sinners, the harsh. Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 says to us, And I stood, I, John, stood upon the sand of the sea. Meaning I stood above the sea and I looked at the sea. I stood above the unbelievers and looked at the unbelievers. And I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns. And upon the horns, ten crowns. And upon the heads, the blasphemy. Out of the sea. This describes this beast as the Antichrist. We know in the surrounding verses and the surrounding chapters around in Revelation 13 that it talks about the dragon. And the dragon being in the heavens and the dragon warring with the woman, the bride, the Christ, the church, and, and doing battle. The dragon being cast out of heaven and fallen and bringing a third of the stars, a third of the angels with it as it fell. Is Satan was cast out of heaven. Satan is the dragon and it says that the dragon empowers the beast that rose up out of the sea. The beast is the Antichrist. Literally, an individual, a man or, check this out, maybe even a woman that rose up, uh, come on somebody, maybe even a woman that rose up out of the unbelievers to lead the nations of the world against Jesus Christ and his followers. The beast is empowered by the dragon, but where does the beast come from? It comes out of the sea. It does not literally come out of the ocean where I go fishing with my dad. Amen? Amen. I've been out there. There's some funky things in that water, but there's no beast that looks like an antichrist in that water. <laughs> it, the, the, the beast is the antichrist. It is a, the chief unbeliever that rises up out of the unbelievers. The sea represents unbelievers in the book of Revelation. Now, 
We remind ourselves why Pastor Red is doing all this, because he wants you to know that he's still going to be fishing in heaven. Because it says in Revelation 21 and 1 that there was no more sea, which means at the end of the book of Revelation, there's no more unbelievers. But there's still an ocean. There's still fish in the water. And you say, well, I'm glad that you want to believe that, Pastor Red. And I say, well, I believe it because the Bible says so, and I'm getting ready to show you so. I did all of that foundation to bring you to this nugget because God gave me this wrinkle and I want to share it with you. <laughs> Revelation chapter 22 verses 1 and 2 says, And he showed me, John, a pure river of water of life, clear, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, the flow of it, on either side of the river, there was the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, yielding fruit for every month, and the leaves of the tree were healing to the nations. We have a picture at the end of the book of Revelation of the throne of God here in the new heaven and the earth and this new river throwing out of the flowing out of the throne. I have a question for you. You ever been to a river? Yes. Where does all that water go? To the sea. To the sea. <laughs> Everybody knows that sooner or later every river winds up in the sea. So if there is this river flowing out of the throne of God, where is that water going? Well, I say to you, it's going into the sea. You say, well, the book of Revelation says there's no more sea. Yes, it says that there are no more unbelievers in the new earth. But there is a beautiful sea full of fishes. Now, if only I had a scripture to prove it. I'll bet I do too. I'll bet I wouldn't have jumped up here without one. Amen. If God hadn't given me one, I wouldn't have jumped up here. But once he gave me one, I couldn't wait to get up here. I'm chomping at the bed. Watch this, Pastor Debbie's getting ready to yell. Ezekiel. Yeah. Ezekiel chapter 47, beginning in verse 1. Afterwards, he brought me again unto the door of the house, and behold, waters issued out from under the threshold of the house eastward. This door is the door of the temple. And this is the river of life that proceeds out from the temple. For the forefront of the house of the temple stood towards the east, and the waters came down from under the right side of the house, the right side of the altar, the south side of the altar. Then brought he me out of the way of the gate northward, and led me about the way without unto the utter gates by the way that looketh eastward, and beheld there ran out waters on the right side. And when the man that had the line in his hand went forth eastward, he measured a thousand cubits. They went a thousand cubits away, and he brought me to the waters, and the waters were up to the ankles. Come on now. Again, he measured a thousand, and he brought me through the waters, and the waters were to the knees. Again, he measured a thousand and brought me to the waters, and the waters were to the loins. Do you see what is happening? He's getting away from the temple, and the river is growing. It's becoming deeper. It's becoming wider. Where is all this water going? Where is all this river going? This river is going to the sea. Afterward, he measured a thousand, and it was a river that was so great that I could not pass over. For the waters were risen, waters to swim, and a river that could not be passed over. And he said unto me, Son of man, John, hast thou seen this? Then he brought me and caused me to return to the bank of the river. Now when I had returned, behold, the bank of the river, there were very many trees. On the one side and the other, please understand that Ezekiel is talking about the same thing that is revealed to us in the last chapter of Revel last two chapters of Revelation. In the new heavens and the new earth, the throne and the river of life flowing out. But it gets better. Here we go. You ready, Richard? And then he said unto me, These waters issue out towards the east country and go down into the desert and go into the sea. Hallelujah. The scripture says that that river flows into the sea. There is a sea. There is a sea of water where there are fish, where the river goes. There is no more sea of unbelievers. There is, all of that has been revealed and done away with. But there is a real living sea where the water of life is flowing. These waters issue towards the east country and go down into the desert. They go down into the sea, which being brought forth into the sea, the water shall be healed. And it shall come to pass that... Everything that liveth, which moveth, wheresoever the river shall come, it shall live. And there shall be a very great multitude of, oh, come on, somebody, the fishing hole is going to be full. There's going to be a multitude of fish. This is going to be every day a good fishing day, amen? 
these waters shall come hither, for they shall be healed, and everything shall live. It shall come to pass that they will be full of a great multitude of fish. But this is where we've come. Verse 10. And it shall. Say with me, it shall. It shall. It shall come to pass that the fishers, those who have fished, shall stand upon it from Engedi even unto Eneglem. And they shall be a place to spread forth their nets. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, as are the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. I've said all of these things here today to read this last half, this last third of this last verse. Their fish shall be according to their kinds, exceedingly many. If you believe that you are building relationships in this life, just for this life, if you believe that you are just fishing to build your present kingdom, if you believe that you are just fishing to build the church for here and today, you haven't really received what this is saying. Because this says that you and I who fish for men will be standing alongside Peter and John. Those disciples called to be fishers of men. Those who have fished for relationships in this life shall stand on that river and they shall stand with their kinds, the ones of the sea that they have... Thank you. Come on now. Thank you, Lord. We are building relationships here and today. We are suffering sometimes. We are embarrassed sometimes. We are reaching out and rejected to people sometimes. But we are building eternal relationships. And I say to you, and it is worth it. Because it's not a relationship for this month. It's not a relationship for a year or two while they're in the church. It is an eternal relationship that we are building. The risk is worth the reward. The discipline of fishing around the clock. The discipline of dealing with the winds. Fighting the current. Dealing with the boat being broken down. Is worth it because we are building a eternal relationships. You and I will be in the kingdom of heaven enjoying the relationships that, that, have, that have come along the way. Yes. Yes. Because we were doing what we were called to do. Amen. Because we were called out of a solitary existence. <laughs> we were called out of the simple solitude of a simple life of, of caring for ourselves and looking no farther. We were called into the complexity of relationship. Relationships that at times will make us cry. Relationships that at times will make us grieve. Relationships at times that will just do us wrong will hurt. But it is so worth the reward. Because there are a multitude of kinds that will be with us there by that river forever. We are fishers. Not just of men and women. But fishers of eternity. 